All right, let's take a look at the early river valley civilizations that we're going to study in our early civilizations unit. Okay, here's a map. This is a map that should uh, be similar to the one that's in your journal. And as I go through each of the river valley civilizations, I'm going to want you to record where they're located on the map that's in your journal. So let's start off with the first one. That's Mesopotamia. That's going to be our oldest civilization that we explore. And that's located in the Tigris and the Euphrates river valleys. The next one is Ancient Egypt, which is located in the northern part of Africa and runs along the Nile River. The next one is China, and we're actually going to be looking at the Yellow River Valley, which is the northern part of China. And then the fourth one you need to know is the Indus Valley, which actually runs right through the center of what we would today call modern Pakistan, and that's the Indus River. Okay, so Mesopotamia, Ancient Egypt, China, and the Indus Valley are the four big early river valley civilizations that we're going to study. Okay, so make sure you record the locations of these in your journal. Okay, let's start off with a review of the notes that are there. Let's start off with the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. First of all, they flow south through central Iraq. They empty into what we call the Persian Gulf. And what's interesting is that this area, Mesopotamia, where the two rivers flow, actually translates as land between the rivers. So Mesopotamian civilization was able to exist because both the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers often flooded. When the rivers flooded, they deposited rich soil, and that soil made the land very good for agriculture. And so the land between the rivers, Mesopotamia, is that land literally between the Tigris and the Euphrates River, where there at one time had been lots of fertile soil. Okay, this map shows us a pretty good detail of what that area might have looked like. And you can see there's this area called the Fertile Crescent. This Fertile Crescent is that green area, and that's an area that stretches all the way from the Persian Gulf along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers and down on the west along the Jordan River. Okay, so that area is where man's earliest civilization is thought to have started, and as a result of these rivers flooding and the fertile farmland that was there, um, it contributed to the rise of civilization. And you can see that there are different civilizations that existed in Mesopotamia at different times. So the Sumerian region that's in the purple area over on this side of the map over here is basically the earliest civilizations. And you can see the cities of Ur, Lagash, Urk, Uma, Nippur, Kush. Uh, those are all part of Sumerian civilization. And then there are the Babylonian cities of, say, Akkad and uh, Babylon itself. Okay, and those cities you can see are within that red area. So particularly when Babylon it conquered most of the Mesopotamia region, uh, it conquered mostly along the Euphrates River. All right, so this area is basically where the earliest civilization started. And again, it all has to do with the rivers, flooding, and fertile soil as a result. All right, let's take a look at the Nile River. The Nile River is an unusual river because it flows northward from the highlands of East Central Africa to the Mediterranean Sea. Most of the world's rivers that we see either flow south or sometimes they might flow east. But keep in mind, rivers don't just flow in any direction. They flow down. So what this tells us is that as the Nile River reaches the Mediterranean, that's a low-lying level at about zero elevation at sea level. But it starts very, very far south in Africa where the Great Rift Valley has started, places like Lake Victoria, which is actually the source of the Nile River. Okay, so in this case, the Nile actually flows north. Here's another uh, image that gives you an idea. Again, it's the longest river in the world. It's 4,100 miles long. That's assuming that you stretch it out in a straight line. Uh, and you can see that, again, from the Nile Delta down by the Mediterranean Sea over here on the chart, okay, and you can follow the river all the way up to the first cataract. This isn't even the full length of the river. If you look on the other side, you can see that the river flows almost at the length of the United States up to what we would call Lake Victoria and the Great Rift Valley. So 4,100 miles, okay, that's a pretty long river. If you stretched it out in a straight line, that would be like going from New York all the way to Hawaii. Okay? And again, this satellite image up here gives you a very good idea of what's on either side of the Nile. It's desert, all right? So there's desert on the west, there's desert on the east. The fertile land is located along the river itself because the river, again, floods, and every year when it flooded, it deposited rich soil. And you can see a lot of that rich soil ended up in the Delta region down here by the Mediterranean, which made agriculture uh, possible and as a result helped to the rise of civilization. Okay, and as a result, Egypt is known as the gift of the Nile. 
So here's a close-up shot of that delta. Again, all the cities are located right before the delta or right within the delta, and that's because without that river, without the flooding of the river every year, they wouldn't have had fertile soil. Without the fertile soil, no food, no food. You can't basically have civilization. Okay? All right, let's take a look at the Yellow River in China. The Yellow River is also pronounced Huanghe in Chinese. Huang means yellow, He means river. It runs through northern China, and it actually empties into what we call the Yellow Sea. And you can see, if you follow the river, that it basically has a pretty big bend in it in a couple of places before it reaches the, uh, the Yellow Sea. And this area here where it says Chang'an, or what today is known as Xi'an, was the original ancient capital of China. And again, it was located pretty close to the bend in the Yellow River. Okay, why is it yellow? Well, if you look at these pictures, you can see the color does look very yellow. That's because what's in the river is what's called loess. And loess is a yellow-brown soil that gets deposited in the river. Uh, if you go to northern China, there's a lot of dust. It blows in from the Gobi Desert out west. That dust gets in the air, and over time it just settles on the ground. Well, after millions of years of doing this, most of the northern terrain of this part of China is really just compacted loess soil. And Basically, the river runs through this region. As the river runs through it and cuts through it, it basically erodes the soil away. And so the dirt, the soil up there in the north of China, is actually this yellow lowest soil, and it gets in the river. Now, this lowest soil is very good, actually. It's great for farming. When the river floods, it deposits this soil, uh, and when the water recedes, the deposited soil then becomes productive farmland. So you can see in this image, it appears that people are living very close to the actual river. Uh, now they do get flooded, but at the same time, one reason why you live close to the river is because when the river floods, it does produce fertile soil. Okay? It's also called the River of Sorrow, and that's because when it does flood, it usually causes massive destruction. So there are areas along the Yellow River where the Chinese over centuries have built basically these large dikes. And these dikes are barriers that help prevent the river from flooding and flooding the surrounding farmland. But there's a serious problem here. It's hard to tell in the photograph, but this barrier, these dike barriers along the edge are at a higher elevation than the surrounding countryside. So this ground actually slopes up to where the dikes are. So when the river does flood, if it breaches these dikes, that creates a huge problem because all of a sudden, the water is going to flow to its easiest place. Gravity is going to take it down. If it breaches the dike, it's going to flow downward into this area, and it's going to flood for many, many miles. All right, let me show you this diagram. This might help you understand it. Let's say people live on either sides of the Yellow River. And as you can see here, there are the banks of the Yellow River, right there where it's yellow. And so to prevent flooding, let's say thousands of years ago, they built these barriers along the side of the river and that prevented flooding. But the problem is because there's lowest soil in the water, what happens over time is the lowest soil deposits on the bottom of the riverbed and that raises the riverbed. So now the next time the river floods, they've got a serious problem. So the solution, what they did was this, was to build larger dikes or barriers along the edge. Now, a thousand years later, they do the same thing because once again, the river deposits the soil and raises, raises the riverbed up. So they have to build, again, bigger barriers. And over time, again, the water builds up because of the deposit on the bottom of the bed, build bigger dikes, water gets up high, you build another dike, and now when it does flood, it doesn't just flood a local area, it floods everywhere for maybe hundreds if not thousands of miles. It's really severe. So this is in some places along the river where this occurs. It, people hadn't thought about this. Let's say, you know, a couple thousand years ago, people hadn't thought that the long-term consequences of building bigger and bigger barriers would ultimately result in a river that in places actually flows at a higher elevation than the surrounding countryside. But today, the people that live there have to live with those consequences. And as a result, they have to deal with severe flooding when it occurs. Let's take a look at the Indus River. And you can see the Indus River here flows through what we would call Pakistan, right through the center of Pakistan. So it flows through central Pakistan, and it empties into the Arabian Sea. And it's also the location of South Asia's earliest civilization. 
Okay, so it starts in the Himalayas and it flows right down the middle of Pakistan today. And you can see right here in this purple area, this is what we call the Indus Valley Civilization. And there are several cities located on this map. There's Harappa, there's Kalibangan, and then there's Mohanjadaro. And we're going to later on in the course take a look, a closer look at Harappa and Mohanjadaro as some of the earliest civilizations along the Indus River. Here's a satellite shot of it, and you can see it's a pretty dramatic river. Lots of bends and turns. It follows the topography that's located there up on the left on the mountains. And again, you can see the mountain topographic features are pretty bendy right there. And again, the river follows much of that. But also you can notice that it appears that the river changes its course from time to time. And so that's actually a problem even today in modern Pakistan, that from time to time the river does uh, overflow its banks and change its course. That's not, that's not an irregular thing. Right? But again, like all the other rivers that we looked at, deposits fertile soil, makes the surrounding farmland around the river very good for agriculture, and that's what contributes to the rise of civilization.